<laughs> the book of Acts, I almost said Exodus, the book of Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Now, Paul is on his first missionary journey along with Barnabas and the team that they have been able to gather together from Cyprus. We see that he has gone into Pisidian Antioch. There's two Antiochs. There's one that where uh, they were sent from that was uh, close to Jer- closer to Jerusalem, over in the Middle East. And now we're in uh, Asia Minor. They had gone through Cyprus, and now they are uh, many hundreds of miles away from home. And they are up in the middle of what is present-day Turkey, what would have been called Asia Minor at this time. It was very much more European back then than it is today because the Muslim conquest of the the 600s uh, really transformed that area, the Middle East, and even Northern Africa, all into Spain, into more of a Mid-Eastern culture than than they were at the time. Uh, Whenever Paul was preaching to the um, Ephesians and the Galatians and even here in Antioch, they were much more under the Roman and the Greek influence, and the languages were even a lot different. But now <clears throat> Paul has uh, gone into this town that's kind of a Roman garrison town, and uh, it's kind of a central hub or a county seat, as we would call it, of the area. In fact, uh, uh, Sir, Sir William Ramsey says that even the um, the centurion was known as the centurion of the region. In other words, it was a regional type of town. And it, the, the centurion, who was, of course, one of the leaders of the army, would have a jurisdiction or would have a, a kind of like a, a constable or a, justice or a person who, a peacekeeper, that would be in charge of the soldiers around there to keep the peace. And so this was... Uh, this was a regional type of town, and Paul had gone in, like so many of these towns at this time, especially in the middle in Europe in European culture, there would be a large uh, group of Gentiles, but then there would also be that very influential synagogue that was there. And we see the pattern that Paul had in his early days of preaching. He would go to the synagogue first, he would preach the gospel there usually get kicked out, and then uh, go and preach to, uh, from, from the people that he had taken from the synagogue, and of course, uh, the Gentiles who listened, and he would preach the gospel to them. Now, Paul does something very unusual. In fact, it is so countercultural that it caused everybody to raise their eyebrow whenever Paul addressed the people back in the first part of the message, and he talked about those who fear God. Now, the, the God-fearers, were and this folks the the gospel people were saved through the gospel even in the Old Testament. Can you think of some Old Testament Gentiles that were saved? Even somebody that was murdered by David was Uriah the Hittite. Remember, he was saved. He he was part of uh, Israel. We know uh, they were called righteous people. Uh, they were or they were, they were called uh, um, they were. Um, uh, excuse me, they were called, uh, uh, as Paul calls them, um, he says t- to the people of um, not strangers, but the friends of God, or to the, those who fear God, God-fearers. And so th- what would happen, would the men, would, the Jewish men would sit on one side of the synagogue, the women would sit on the other, and Gentiles who were drawn to God through the through the preaching of the word even even in the Old Testament, they would come and sit in the back. Remember uh, uh, people that were saved, the centurions that were saved, uh, uh, Cornelius. Uh, remember, he was, a, a, he was a righteous man. He was a man who, who feared God, as we saw. And, he, and, and Peter went down, and of course, he gave him the gospel, and, uh, and he was saved uh, or came to the Lord through Peter's message. But here we see this is now what God is doing through Paul. But Paul does something where he addresses not only to men and brethren, regular Jews, but also to you who fear God. And that's the one thing that a rabbi didn't do. Now, Paul was known as a rabbi. He probably had certain markings on his, 
uh, coat or on his uh, on his uh, hem of his garment that would let people know that uh, he had been trained in the schools of Gamaliel or whatever. And so they would invite the visiting people who knew the word of God to speak. Remember, they even they invited the Lord Jesus to speak in his own hometown because they considered him a rabbi. And so he goes in and he says to them, men and brethren, and to you who fear God. And when he said that, everybody goes, oh, you didn't even, I mean, the Jews, I mean, the Gentiles just weren't even recognized as part of the congregation. They were just, you know, people that were lucky enough to hear the word of God. And they came and we, we deigned to let them sit back there and listen to what we, what we take, hold for, we, we, what we take for granted. And so he, had, so that immediately attracts a great deal of attention. And then he preaches to them, and every key message or every message that you see in the book of Acts of any length is going to have four elements to it. First of all, it's going to have that Jesus came in the flesh. It's going to have his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And uh, that's gonna, every, every message in the book of Acts will have those four, four areas or four things that are covered uh, as Paul and as uh, Peter and others preached the word of God, even Stephen preaches the word of God, you're going to see the incarnation, you're going to see the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as he preaches that, it, there are many Jews, and this is what happens. Folks, were, pe were Jews saved in these synagogues? Were they saved before they heard the gospel? And when I say that, was an Old Testament Jew that read the Word of God, were they saved? Yes. What I mean by that is, as you look back, you know, everybody is saved through faith. And they were looking forward to the Messiah. And we know that uh, even as we saw where uh, uh, John talked this morning about how that uh, there were those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews but are not. In other words, there are a lot of people out there that... Uh, that say that they believe the Torah, they believe the Old Testament, the law, the prophets, but they live like the devil. Does that sound like a bunch of Baptists? <laughs> and so uh, in the Old Testament, people were looking forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they heard it, they instantly accepted it. Even Simeon and Anna, we said, begin with those. Isn't it interesting? When they saw it, they knew it. And these people in the synagogues, when Paul went and preached, they knew the Holy Spirit was working and they heard it and they believed it. And they came and they were willing to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the Gentiles listened also. Unfortunately, we see in the pattern that's going to be here in this age of the Gentiles and as God sets up the church, we see that uh, more and more there's became more and more resistance of the Jew in the synagogue to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you see that transition now as the center of worship transforms from the temple and from the synagogue to the local church. And so we see that uh, through the book of Acts, we're going to see fewer and fewer Jews being saved and more and more Gentiles being saved. And then by the time that Paul gets to Rome, he goes in and preaches to the people, the Jews at Rome. And of course, there's many, there's already churches set up in Rome uh, that, uh, that had been set up by others. And so he went in and, and, the Gentile, and the Jews were already so hardened that he said, I'm going to quit even trying to go to the, uh, to the uh, synagogues anymore. I'm just going to preach in the churches. And that's where the book of Acts ends. In other words, we see the transition from the Jewish economy now to the Gentile economy. And the church now is God's ordained institution for the propagation of the gospel in this world. Now we know the church had a beginning and it will have an end. The beginning was on what day? The day of Pentecost. When is the church going to end? When is it going to be? When is it going to end? We know it's going to happen I asked Dave back in when his surgery was going to be, and he said, I think it's going to be right around a certain date. Well, uh, he's probably got that circled if he thinks that he knows what day it is. Uh, if you're going to get married, you probably have that day circled. You better. But you know, whatever. Uh, there are certain things that uh, you just know are going to be there. Well, I don't know what God has circled. He hasn't told me yet. But at the same time, he's got a certain day. He's coming back for his church. And what do we call that? We call that the rapture of the church and we so we know the church has a beginning and it will have an end 
And then we see God starting to deal and transform the Jews again. And what do we call that time uh, that uh, we call the seven-year tribulation? But what is it also called? The time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is Israel. So we see it gets, it's transforming and God is going to reconcile Israel back to himself. Now to say all that, we see that now with the beginning, God is pulling the church out of the Jewish economy and now I've noticed that we don't even get into pastors and deacons. You know, we've gotten into deacons, but we haven't really gotten into the leadership of the church yet. And that's going to be de developing in the book of Acts. And he tells the Ephesians, he says, yeah, he sends some prophets and some whatever, and those who are going to pass away. But he says, but also pastors and teachers. So then we see in the church of Ephesus, God is ordaining pastors and so forth that, uh, were not even, that weren't there until the time of Paul and the time of uh, the mission to the, to the Gentiles. And so now we see that uh, when these Gentiles heard and the many believing Jews, when they heard the truth, they believed it. And so we see in verse 42, so when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Oh, can't you come back next Sunday? Boy, that's great whenever you have people saying that kind of stuff. Now, when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes. Now, a proselyte was a person. Now, if you were a Gentile and you had been baptized into, into Judaism and accepted all their way, circumcision for men and all that kind of stuff, then you were considered a, you could come into the congregation as a proselyte. And so there were proselytes there. There were, the, there were those, those who feared God sat in the back. And then you had the proselytes uh, that, uh, that were Gentiles, but they had converted to Judaism. Um, wasn't uh, one of the president of one of our former president's uh, uh, son and sons-in-law, or no, his, his daughter went, became a proselyte. She married a Jew, and then she took on she be, took on Judaism, and so that's and she could go in and worship with him in the synagogue without being separated, except by how they do it. And so uh, we see that uh, uh, now. So we see that the devout proselytes uh, followed Paul and Barnabas, and speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city, boy, this really stirred up a hornet's nest. Hey, this guy's preaching, and even the, the Jews said, he's, he's preaching to us as well as the Jews. And they're saying, hey, that's kind of interesting. Let's go in here. And so he said, almost all the whole city together to hear the word of God. And when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming and opposing the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It is necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light before the Gentiles, that you should be for the salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spread throughout the region. But the Gentile, excuse me, but the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city and raised a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. But they shook the dust off their feet and against them and came to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy with the Holy Spirit. Now, Lord, we pray that you'll bless the word to our hearts and lives. Give us understanding. Give us inspiration to do your calling, Lord. It is necessary for us as a church to take the gospel to a lost and dying world, to the Jew first and also to the, Jew, to the Gentile. May we fulfill your calling, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You know, it's one of the first things that you will notice as you read this passage is the word, the word, the word. How many times that it tells us that, uh, and notice in verse 42, that when they heard these words, uh, then notice we, they continued in the grace of God in verse uh, 43. Then we see in verse 44 that they came together to hear 
the word of God. And Paul grew boldly and they preached the word of God. And then you see in verse 48, where he says the Gentiles heard this and they were glad uh, and glorified the word of God. In verse 49, and the word of the Lord was spreading throughout all the land. So we see that it was the word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Oh, that yes, we want to do attract, we want to attract people to church here. We might have a dinner. We might have, a, we might have something special. We might, uh, whenever they have the parades out there, take us, as we've done in the past, uh, take little bottles and put our church name and logo on it and invite people to church. We'll do all kinds of things to, to get people to come. But in the end, if we're not preaching the word, folks, all that is vain. All we're doing is raising a crowd. And so we see it's the word of God. We, we might start a, a food pantry, whatever. But folks, if we could send people uh, away with a full stomach and a, an empty heart and a lost soul. And so the important thing is the word. Notice how many times the word, the word, the word. Faith cometh by hearing and not by a plate of food. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That is our main focus. That is what God calls us to do here. We're to do it attractively. We're to do it compassionately. We're to do it lovingly. But in the end, if we're not preaching the word, then we're nothing more than a social club. And how sad it is to see that so many churches today have left the gospel and have gone into look, to socialism or into to the social gospel. I even heard a uh, and how they're perverting the word. Even a man this past week that uh, is supposed to be one of the mega churches in our country, and he is uh, transforming the whole idea of uh, preaching the word and justify, justification by grace into social justice. And so if you really want to be justified by faith, you've got to be a social justice warrior. And all this garbage that you're hearing today, folks, that's totally, that's blasphemy. And I don't care who preaches it. And so because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And what is the word of God? The word of God, he is the word, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see that they're preaching the word. Now what happens? Both Jews and Gentiles got ex extremely excited about the word of God. It creates results. That's why I like to say, uh, I don't mind negative results or negative reactions to the word. When you witness to somebody and they get a little rude or they get a, and they know that they're getting irritated, I'd rather have that than a person say, oh, I know what you mean and all that because you know that you're getting a reaction where they're consciously having to decide whether they're going to accept the Lord or not. Uh, I used to teach uh, in high school in the, uh, the ninth grade Bible class and it seems like ninth graders were always uh, the pivotal class. But... Uh, Sometimes you would say things, especially as these kids were trying to form their own uh, values. And they, back then, uh, Farrah Fawcett was one of the, you know, and all that. this was a long time ago when I was teaching. These guys are up in their 50s and 50s now. But, uh, all the, but uh, remember, we would talk about things like that and the, the encroachment. And I was so old-fashioned. And boy, I, but I would rather get a negative reaction from people that are thinking that people that just are passive and just don't say anything, but then go out and do what they want to do. So if you get uh, negative reactions because of your stand for the Lord Jesus Christ or your proof, then at least you know that people are having to think enough to re accept or reject it. But here you see those who, I like, I like to call Christianity pucker or duck Christianity. I mean, either you, you hug me and kiss me or you... I better duck because you're going to swing, you know? So, you know, that's basically what Christianity is, is it? It's either people love it and accept it or they totally reject it and hate it. And so, so we see that this is what's happening here and that we see that the Jews went out of the synagogue, notice that they were the ones who controlled the services, but the Gentiles, they set about, in fact, they, they begged that uh, you would come back. And when they had broken up, Many of the devout Jews and proselytes, they followed Paul. And Paul spent a week of time of being able to talk to these people and, and show them the word of God and get deeper into it uh, through discipleship. And I imagine he spent hours and uh, I talked to Brother Larry. He said, some of my days in France uh, when we would, would be 18-hour days just talking to people about the Lord. 
and rich pe or people that would come to know the Lord, and they couldn't get enough of it. And they started five or six churches in their ministry there. And what a blessing that is to know. And of course, it wears you out. But at the same time, this was a very prosperous time for Paul and Barnabas as they were preaching the word and they were responding. And so they were, they were striking while the water was hot. And so we see that uh, they were speaking to them and they persuaded them to continue. Now, folks, one of the pro problems that we have had in American-style evangelism is we have the hour of decision. Just come forward and you, know, you shake the preacher's hand and everything will change. Well, no, that's just the beginning of a change. Now, if you could, now I believe a person is saved before they come forward and at the moment they say yes or at the moment they, they say, I, I, the Lord Jesus come into my heart, they're saved. But, uh, but salvation isn't that... I, when I witness to somebody and they say, I was asking them, when were you saved? Oh, I was saved. And they will tell you that if they know, or usually they'll say they were baptized. And I'll say, wait a minute, that's not, so that's always a big question mark. If they can't tell you when they're saved and you keep, keep an ear open and you keep um, finding ways of finding out if they were genuinely saved or if they just had a religious experience. But, uh, but salvation is more than, it, it, that's the start. Whenever you decide publicly to accept the Lord as your Savior, that's the beginning of something. And what we want to see is a continuing. I've seen people, and I think of one man in my early ministry, I had to learn how to ward this off. But uh, he came to church and he brought his 12-year-old boy along with him. And we went on camping trips and stuff like that with the kids and so forth. And uh, his boy got saved when he was 12 years old. And he, boy, the, this man, good old Southern Baptist, Southern who was Baptist, I don't know if he was Southern Baptist, but, uh, but uh, there again, his, he thought his whole obligation was to get that boy down the aisle and baptized. And then after he was baptized, they were off to the races and I never saw him much anymore because he had done everything he needed. His son was saved. Uh, folks, that is something wrong with that kind of philosophy. Salvation is more than just a ticket out of hell. It's more than fire insurance. It is a total walk with God. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Amen. And we see now that these people were being transformed. They were saying, you know, what's going on? We, we understand, but these people in the synagogue are not preaching what you're preaching. And it was a whole cultural divide. You mean, we, don't, we, we need to start something where we can hear about Jesus Christ, where we're not going to hear it in the synagogue? Yes, that's called a church. And we're going to start a church and we're going to organize people uh, in order that they can hear the word of God. And so this is where the churches began. And notice they continued. They didn't just have a religious experience, but it was a total transform, transformation of their lives. And notice on the next Sabbath, also the whole city came together to hear the word of God. And when the Jews saw the multitudes, and there you have the rejectors, you have those who accept, and they continued in the word. But then we see that there were those who rejected the preaching of the word, and you will always have that. And that is what is so, so interesting to me how that two people of equal backgrounds or whatever, I look at my own life and people that were close to me, why do certain people have a hunger and thirst for the word and other people that hear the same message and they have the same circumstances and they reject it? That is just phenomenal. Oh, we sing that song, the wonder of it all, the wonder that God can save me, that he can love me. And there are people much more worthy than me that should have accepted the Lord and be closer to the Lord than I, than I ever should be, then why didn't they get saved? I just don't understand it, and I won't until I get to heaven. And we're going to look at that in a moment. But he says, and they were filled with envy and contradicting the, and blaspheming. They heard the same message, same circumstances, but there were those who believed and those who didn't. And they opposed the things spoken by Paul. And then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and notice now, this, they, they were visitors. They were going to this well-established synagogue where hundreds of people, and now many people, very influential, and they were probably had people listening out the windows. 
and uh, various, I mean, you had uh, politicians, everything, everybody there. And it was necessary that, and notice they, they grew bold, they said it is necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, to the Jew first. But since you reject it, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Now that is an interesting turn of phrase. Here you are the religious people, but you're rejecting the truth and you judge for yourselves that you're unworthy of eternal life. In other words, you're missing it all. But you have judged and it's not that any of us are worthy, but you have judged for yourself that you are unworthy of the word of God or of, of eternal life. I'm, we're offering you eternal life and you say you don't want it. How sad it is that uh, there are many people because of their position in life, their pride, maybe their fun that they're having. Um, they think that, that they reject the Lord. I, just recently, we, my wife and I were in the presence of a man that uh, um, we were talking and he said, he just seems like he doesn't want to be around. And uh, I was thinking, you know, Yes, he is upset with it, but who is unworthy? He's judging for himself. Now, I'm not worthy to go to heaven, and neither are you. But the only thing that makes it worthy is because I fall at the feet of the person in Revelation where even the angels fall and say, thou art worthy to receive honor and glory. And, and so I fall, what makes me worthy is not myself, but the Lord Jesus Christ who came to die on the cross for my sins. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And when before the throne, I stand in him at last, my, or stand, stand in him complete, uh, my, okay, help me finish it. I love these verses, but then I get, I, I can sing them better than I can see them. But uh, uh, my soul shall still repeat. My, Jesus died, my soul to save. My lips still, shall still repeat. And so, yes, I don't deserve it. But if anybody doesn't, like I said, there are people that have been a whole lot better than me, people that I look up to that, and why, are the, why don't they see what I saw? I can't understand it. And yet God would save a person like me. No wonder that person would say, the wonder of it all, that God would save me. Why would he open my eyes and another person's eyes be totally closed. And so we see then that as he says this, he says, for the Lord has commanded us. Now it's interesting, here's the preaching of the gospel. The two different times in Isaiah, and even Paul, or it's gonna be even Abraham that was told, and God said, you're gonna be an oracle to the world. An oracle is a mouthpiece to the world. The Jew was to be an oracle, the mouthpiece to the world. And you will see the prophets. When you read Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, you read those longer prophets and they're preaching to the nations around them. Do you remember one prophet that went to a Gentile city and won 6,000 people to the Lord? What was his name? Jonah. And so the gospel was going out from the Jews and they were the oracles of the, to the world. And oh, did they miss the boat whenever so many of them had grown cold and as a result, now we see that he says, he says, for the Lord has commanded us, I will set a light, uh, set you as a light to the Gentiles. That was the Jew. And even remember those who were looking for the Lord found him. Those who were looking for the Messiah coming, they found him. Even Simeon and Anna in the temple. And remember whenever Simeon saw that baby, he said, there he is, and he quoted, he said, he will be a light to the Gentiles. And so godly people, when they saw or heard of the Messiah, they gladly, accepted, they saw it immediately. Well, because they were saved already, and they recognized the Lord as their Savior. These, uh, these people who uh, were God-fearers, they recognized it immediately, and they were willing, they accepted the Lord and because they knew the truth. I mean, the Holy Spirit revealed it to them because faith cometh by hearing. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. These 
God-fearers believed God and it was counted unto them for righteousness. So when they heard the truth and Jesus is the truth, they accepted it gladly. Did they not? And so we see that those who were looking for the Lord always found him. And they found him here. But those were the religious people also that, uh, like so many today, they're all bark and no bite. They're all uh, fluff and no substance. They have an outer garment that is totally empty. And we see that uh, they are the ones who reject. They, they've got their status in their religion. They've got their place. They got their rewards in what they do in the name of God. And yet, don't invade their turf with the truth. And this is what has happened. And so he quotes this verse. And, uh, he and then, of course, Luke chapter 2, verse 32, is where Simeon quotes this verse, quotes Isaiah. So we see that uh, there were those who rejected and those who accepted. Then uh, we see that... Uh, but the word of God was glorified. The word, the word, the word, the word is so important. Now, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the Lord. And now the phrase that really throws a curve into a lot of people it says, and as when many has been appointed to eternal life, believed. As many as, does that mean that God pointed he said, okay, you're going to be saved, you're going to be saved, and the rest of you are predestined to go to hell. Uh, does that mean that uh, limited atonement where uh, they didn't make a choice themselves, God made it for them? No. Notice um, the word appointed there, or the idea of, uh, what's the King James word there? Uh, there's another word there, but uh, the idea there is it's a, it's a military term, which means fall in. Uh, whenever we were told, okay, guys, fall in, what, what did you do? You knew where to go. I mean, anybody who's been in the service, you know what to do. Uh, you knew exactly where you to stand. You knew exactly what line you were in, the position in that line and everything. Fall in, guys. Well, folks, whenever you get saved, God is saying, fall in. So if you are appointed, then you're an appointed to service for him. You're, you're saved to serve. You're saved to be part of God's army, God's, God's kingdom. And so these people fell in. And they believed, Why? Because they believed. Now, yes, there, there can be more theological implications there. I don't understand how that these people were saved before the foundations of the world. I don't understand that at all. But if I did, I mean, there's so many things that I don't understand about God I like to, whenever somebody, and I, I like to tell younger people, especially guys who are going into the ministry and they got it all figured out, you know, there's uh, five points uh, of this and five points of that. And, you know, God already knows beforehand whether you're going to be saved and all that kind of stuff. It's like the Presbyterian preacher that fell down the stairs and broke both legs and said, praise the Lord, that's over. You know, it's just uh, God already has it all pre preordained what's going to happen. No, uh, I like to tell guys, I say, you don't even understand girls, let alone God, and here you, the God who made them. And so, you know, but I don't understand that at all. And yet, do I believe it? If I understood everything about God, uh, then he'd be a pretty small God. But the Bible says, but his thoughts are above my thoughts, and his ways are above my ways. And there are certain things that I just have to leave with God. Like I said, I don't understand why God would save me. But I also know that God says he's not willing that any should perish. I don't, do you say, well, how do you reconcile all that? I don't. I just do what God tells me to do. And he tells me it's necessary for me to go out and preach the word of God and for this church to preach the word of God. Now that's the necessary thing. Just do it. Whenever an officer said, fall in, you fell in. And he would say, do it. And you say, why? No, you didn't ask why. You just did it. Well, of course, God will explain to us because he is our counselor. But there are certain things he say, I'll just wait till you get to heaven before you're going to know everything about it. And so none of us here, there wasn't a person here that said, you know, I'm going to go, I'm going to do God a favor. I'm going to get saved today. Not a one of you did it, did you? No, there was something that God did in your heart. God called you to salvation. God worked in your heart. God brought you. He gave you a hunger and thirst for him. And that's the reason you're saved today. If you can, if you, is that true in your life? 
Yes. And so don't get all tied up with, you know, uh, I had one uh, person that told me that Pharaoh was born, born predestined to go to hell. No, 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 no. God's not willing to, we, as we make our choices in life, those cho- choices harden our destiny, which we were going. But the Bible tells us today is the day of salvation. Today is the day when you hear the call, gospel call, whenever God, you hear God calling you to service, then this is the day to serve him. There are times where, and the one thing that we have to realize is, and one thing I had to learn in my ministry is <clears throat> don't depend on deathbed professions. Oh, I'll just wait till I know I'm going to die and then I'll get saved. No, you read chapter one of Romans and he says he gave them over to reprobate minds. He said he gave up on them. You read Hosea and he says, Ephraim has joined himself to idols. Leave him alone. Let him go to hell. Now, I, I hope God will never say, you know, I, but uh, you look, uh, even we're going to look at tonight, Leviticus, and he says that he's going to spew the people out of his mouth uh, because of what, how sinful they were. To spew them out of the land. And so we see that uh, God does reject people even before they die. And so don't rest, the, oh, I'll just wait till, till I know I'm going to die and then I'll accept the Lord. Uh, you already pretty well hardened your heart. I have been by the bedside of people that I knew were going to hell and I would witness to them and they say, not now, preacher, I don't have, it's not time. And I'm going, you're going to be dead in, in hours. And so what makes, I don't understand folks, so don't get all tied up, just do what God tells you to do. And so uh, don't try to figure God out because you won't. And when you do, you're just going to get more mixed up and you're going to leave something else out. If you go too far one way and say, well, you just, uh, if we give, if we uh, make it all man's decision, then it becomes humanism. If you make it all God's decision, it becomes fatal to fatalism. Just case or I can't help. No, it's one of the two. And so, but there's somewhere in the middle where God gives the call and you say yes or no. He says fall in or you say I'm going to fall out or I'm going to fall in. And so we see that the people, they fell in and there were people that rejected it. That's the way it's always going to be until the Lord comes. And so we see that um, the word of God was glorified. It was glorified by those who believed. It brings salvation. And we see that, uh, that uh, as a result of that, these people now, it overcame the opposition. And there were a lot of very influential people. Some of these proselytes who were not Christians, or excuse me, they were not, uh, they were not truly believers, as, as, but they had become Jude, part of Judaism, but not, not believers. Uh, they were very prominent in the city. They had married into some of the uh, more power, uh, the power brokers of the city. And so they were causing a lot of problems. And they kicked Paul out, not only out of the city, but out of the entire region. So they probably went down and got the local centurion and said, we got to get rid of this guy. He's a troublemaker. And so the centurions probably ushered them right out of town and right out of the region. And so Paul and Barnabas, they went. And you think it's going to get easier for them now? No. Because they go to Iconium, and just in a few days, Paul's going to be stoned and left for dead. So it gets rougher. And yet we see that the gospel goes forth and there are those who, re- who believe and those who don't. But the one thing that the gospel should bring, and that is the, as the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, there's a love and there's a joy and there's a peace in our Lord Jesus Christ. And the disciples were filled with joy uh, and with the Holy Spirit. Folks, that's what we want. Joy overcomes, joy that looks at the problem. It doesn't look at the problems. It looks at, at the problem solver. Joy looks at the Lord. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Do we really believe that? Oh, that we would realize, we can just expect rejection. The Lord told the apostles in John chapter 16, the world's going to hate you like it hated me. 
but just keep preaching the gospel. And so we see that the word of God is to be glorified. The word of God is to be upheld. The word of God is to be preached. Peter or, or Paul told Timothy, preach the word. Be instant. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a be ready always. To preach it when it's in season. That's when it's popular and people are coming in. And boy, I mean, it's great response. Boy, those are great times. And when it's in season, out of season, that's when nobody wants to hear it. Someone asked me the other day, uh, well, how's your church doing? Is it growing? I said, no, they're staying away by the thousands right now, but we're expecting a few, you know. So there it is. Uh, God's working. And I praise the Lord. We've had visitors recently, but we're going to just keep preaching the word. And I'm expecting God to do some great works here in 2023. And so and there again, are we going to, is it necessary for us to tell people about the Lord Jesus? Can we pass out a track and just invite people to hear the word of God? Can we and compassionately very, and real care for a person's soul that's on their way to hell and let them know that you care about them and that you would want them to have what you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, the word of God, that it will be glorified in our lives and in the people that hear the word of God as we preach it, both in word as well as in deed. Let's pray, Father. <clears throat> Oh, how we pray, Father, that you, your power, your great love, your great truth will flow through us. And as the Holy Spirit and the bride, the church, says, come. Oh, Father, may that be our passionate call to tell people to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to know him as Savior. And whosoever will may come. Thank you, Lord. We don't understand why you would reach down and save people like us. Why that you would call us and we saw the light and we accepted you as our savior and other people that we love and had much more promise than we do and yet they've rejected you. And yet, Father, the call is still there and may we take the message to them. May we continue in the word of God. And may that light shine brightly. May it shine permanently in our lives. May others see it day to day and not just sporadically. But, oh, Father, use this church as a light to Belvedere, to, to this region, to Boo County, that others will know you as their Savior. How we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our hymnals in closing. We're going to turn to hymn number 535.